I've, uh, I've preached at a, a lot of small churches, mainly because it's smaller churches that uh, use the BibleTalk.tv material that we, uh, that we produce. Large uh, churches like uh, Memorial Road, for example, or the, the Edmund Church, uh, of course in Edmund, they have a lot of talented Bible teachers uh, sitting in their pews, you know, PhDs in uh, Bible archeology span and you know, people who have masters in divinity, they're just sitting around, you, know, you, can, you can choose any number of those people to teach your Bible classes, so on and so forth. The point I'm making is that they have a lot of resources sitting in the pew to teach, but a small congregation, on the other hand, uh, they love the idea uh, that they may have access to over you know, 50 different series on different books or Bible topics along with sermons and devos, all from a conservative perspective and absolutely free to use. So if you're, if you're a church of 3,000, eh, you know, that's nice. You know, but if you're a church of 50, or if you're a church of 100, that's a resource that's kind of uh, pretty helpful for you. So, Many times I'm invited to speak in person, especially for these groups, who even though are small in number, are quite generous in supporting our Bible Talk uh, ministry. Now I say all of this uh, because one uh, of the questions that these congregations of you know, 50 to 100 people always ask is, we're such a small group, how are we going to survive? I mean, I get mail from churches that their attendance is 11. I mean, they're always 11. And sometimes if some in-laws visit, they're 13, you know, but that, that's about as big as it gets, 15, but they're still a church. They, they still meet, they still have a, you know, a modest little building and they serve the communion and they help missions and they're still a church. But they ask themselves, how are we going to make it? More recently, the question has been, with all this COVID-19 business and the economy tanking and many of our members staying home from worship and no end in sight, how can we remain functional and growing when just surviving seems to be harder and harder each week? I see some of that attitude here by the worried looks on people's faces and the the shift of our focus away from Jesus and onto issues of safety zones and wearing masks and government policies and how to apply things and where to put the furniture. And you know, of course, the day-to-day -day business of, of, of you know, running a, a local congregation. But I've seen a focus on that a little too much, I think. We have our eyes on that. My answer to the smaller churches, as well as the larger ones like ourselves, is always the same. Remember who the head of the church is. Whether your congregation is 11 people or 1100 people, who's the head of your congregation? Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. Now different church leaders vary from congregation to congregation when it comes to effectiveness and ability and effort and commitment. But there's only one head and he is eminently qualified to be the leader and the head of the church. People say, I'm worried about the church. I say, I'm not worried about the church because Jesus is head of the church. He's the head of the church, not me, not, not the elders. They're the leaders in the local congregation, but they're not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. And I tell them that if the head wants your church to survive and prosper, nothing will be able to stop that. If Jesus Christ says, you will stand, Choctaw, then believe me, you will stand. No matter what happens out there. And if the head decides that the time has come for a certain congregation to cease operating, no amount of money will keep it going. We need to direct our prayers concerning the body 
And when I say concerning the body, I mean all the things concerning the body, the furniture and the masks and the safety and the, the money and the budget and the, all the concerns of the local church. We need to bring those to Jesus, the head of the church. He's the Lord of the Choctaw congregation and he's the Lord of the Luther congregation and he's the Lord of Edmund and all the others. I also believe that the more we know about Jesus's unique character and qualifications to be the head of the church, the more confidence we will have in the survival and the growth of the church, especially during these times of public crisis. For this reason, I'd like for us to review Jesus's resume in order to build our confidence in one of the first things Jesus said about his church, the church that he would be the head of, the church that you and I belong to during these difficult times. He says, I also say to you, and this is in context of speaking to Peter the apostle, I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The gates of Hades includes diseases, pandemics, wars, tornadoes, economic busts. Those are all included in the gates of Hades. Troublemakers, false teachers, you name it. Jesus' qualifications as head of the church are nicely summarized in the epistle of Paul uh, to the Colossians. Before we get to these, however, uh, it'd be helpful if we had a little background information upon, on this epistle so we can understand Paul's comments uh, in context. So Paul himself had never personally visited this church which was situated in what is now known as modern day uh, Turkey. So open your Bibles to Colossians and I'll throw up a couple of slides here to get a little background information about Colossians. So Epaphras or Epaphroditus was a fellow worker of Paul is probably the one who established this congregation after being trained by Paul in the city of Ephesus. Notice the proximity between these two places. He was from there, but he was trained uh, in Ephesus. The problems in this church in, Coloss uh, in Colossae began when a certain heretical movement found its way into this congregation and Epaphras sent to Paul for help and guidance in dealing with it. In other words, there was trouble in the church and he wasn't sure on how to handle it. So he appeals to Paul for help. Now, there are many opinions as to what exactly was being taught that was incorrect. But it seems that some were promoting the concept that in addition to Jesus's death on the cross, there needed to be other works of merit in order to be saved. In other words, some were teaching that in order to obtain complete salvation, these Christians also had to fast or they had to uh, obey certain food laws or they had to take vows of celibacy for one reason or other. Now, this new teaching was dangerous, a false, of course, but dangerous, because first of all, they claimed that Christ's work was incomplete, and in doing so, they denied his power and his position. And then secondly, this in turn was weakening the faith of the church and fostering discouragement and despair and lack of confidence in Christ. You know, Satan uses all kinds of methods to discourage us from being enthusiastic, from being confident, from being willing to serve. He uses all kinds of tactics. In this case, in the case of Colossae, he was using the tactic, the tactic of false teaching, but it was having the same result. People were discouraged. They were like, what's the point? Why should I try? And same thing. Human nature hasn't changed in 2000 years. And so in response to this, Paul writes them a letter in which he describes Jesus's superior status. 
qualifications that firmly establish Jesus as the only possible and true head of the church and leader who could be trusted to deliver on his promise of salvation. So now when interviewing a candidate for a job, we usually look at two main areas, don't we? First of all, uh, we look at, um, we look at uh, personal background and family and history, and social status. You know, we want to know something about the candidate. And also we want to know about their skills and their training and their ability in relationship to the job that we are going to you know, offer them. Well, Paul, in a sense, does this very thing when explaining how eminently qualified Jesus is in order to hold the position as head of the church. And so he begins with uh, personal background uh, information. He begins by listing three things about Jesus' personal background that establishes his qualifications to be the head of the church. And don't miss the point here. As the head of the church, he also sets the doctrine of the church. He also establishes what is necessary to be saved and what is not necessary, and that's the point. All right, so let's keep our eye on the ball here. So in verse 13, he uh, talks about Jesus, first of all, one qualification in his background, he is the beloved son of God. The beloved son of God, Christian read it before, it says, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Another way of saying this is that Jesus is the son of God's love. It is more than just an adjective about how God feels about Jesus. It is a title bestowed on Christ by God himself. Jesus has a great family background in that he wears a title given to him by God the Father that no one else wears. No one else in all of history wears this title, beloved son. No one else is worthy to wear this name. It is exclusively given to Jesus by God. Another thing he says about Jesus's personal background, he says he is the image and fullness of the invisible God. This time you'll need to skip down to verse 15a and read that with me. 15a and verse 19, he says he is the image of the invisible God repeats again in verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all of the fullness to dwell in Him. Now, when we read this verse, we think image, right? A reflection, like a mirror. And it, we find it hard to grasp how an invisible God can somehow be reflected. To understand this particular characteristic of Jesus, I want you to think of this term or this word image as being a derivative and not reflective. A good example of the difference between reflective and derivative is the following. If you draw a picture of a child, well then that's reflective. The picture reflects the image of the child in the drawing or the photograph, that's reflective. However, giving birth to a child, this is derivative. The child and the mother are one because they share the same nature, they share the same life. There's a big difference between reflective and derivative. Of course, this is not a, a perfect parallel because Jesus wasn't created by God, but this example does explain the similarity of natures that Paul is referring to in this verse. When Paul refers to Jesus as the image of the invisible God, he doesn't mean that Jesus is a copy of God in some form, as in a kind of a reflection. No, Paul says that Jesus shares the same nature as God in the derivative sense. A little later in verse 19, he explains it in another way where he says that Jesus has the fullness of God dwelling in him. He's not less than God. He is divine in every way that God is divine. He is divine. And so Jesus has a nature which is unique in that he shares a divine nature with God. And then one last thing Paul says about Jesus's personal background. 
he says that Jesus is the firstborn, verse 15b and 18b. He says he is the firstborn of all creation, that's 15b, and then in 18b he says the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Now, we usually use the term firstborn to describe the first of several children in a family. For example, in our family, Paul is Lee's and my firstborn of our four wonderful children. When Paul the apostle uses this term in reference to Jesus, however, he is describing two very different things about Jesus' special background. First of all, a firstborn refers to Jesus' rank in the universe. Jesus is first in rank over everything and person in the universe because he possesses, he possesses creative power. In other words, he has the ability to create something from nothing. Before anything ever was, Jesus was there. And in things that are there, he is first. It is only natural therefore that he and only he can be the first or the head of the church created by God because he has the first rank in everything. And then firstborn also refers to Jesus's source. Jesus was of God with the nature of God. He was not created by God. Just as God was always there, Jesus was always there. He is first because he is eternal. Now, in verse 15b, Paul describes Jesus' primacy position in relationship to created things. And this is so because he is the agent of creation. So in verse 18b, Paul describes Jesus' primary position in relationship to regenerated things such as the church, because he is also the agent of regeneration. Are you holding all this in here? Paul explains that a very special quality of Jesus as person is that he has first place in creation because the creation originally came into being through him, okay? And then he explains that when the creation was ruined by sin, Jesus was the one through whom it was regenerated as the church. First in created things, first in recreated things, the church. And so Jesus uh, becomes first in everything, both old and new. And so Paul tells us that from a personal background or a personal uh, perspective. Uh, Jesus is perfectly qualified to be the head of the church. He's the only one who is the beloved of God. He shares a divine nature with God and he holds the primary positions in both the old and in the new creation. Okay, so now we move on to skills and special abilities. See, in our search for candidates, we don't only look at a personal background, we also want to examine what skills, what training uh, that a person brings to the job. In chapter one of Colossians, Paul mentions two very special abilities that Jesus has that qualify him for his role as head of the church. First of all, Jesus has the ability to create. Verse 16, it says, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Note how all encompassing this passage is. Everything's been, not, not just everything's been created by him, through him, but everything is created for him, for his purposes. He has supremacy over all the things that have been created because he is the agent of created, creation and he's the purpose of creation. 
And so Paul indicates that Jesus' power is superior to everything and every person within creation. He explains that Jesus' power is not just bigger or stronger or more long lasting, but rather it's a different kind of power. Jesus' power is not mechanical or natural or human in nature. It is, it is creative in nature. No amount of or degree of mechanical, natural or human power can generate or equal creative power. Mechanical, natural and human power exercises itself here in changing or reinventing things that already exist. You got machinery, you take a mountain, you flatten it, you build houses, you know, that's mechanical power. But creative power is the ability to bring something into existence from nothing. Only Jesus has that power. No man, no woman, no person, no authority, no spiritual, angels don't have that power. Satan doesn't have that power. This type of power is possessed and exercised only by divinity. And Jesus has this type of power. Then number two, Jesus has the ability to save souls. In verse uh, uh, 20 to 22, I'll read that in a minute. Uh, we as Christians, we have the ability to tell other people how they can save their souls. You know, more than 40 years ago, I decided that's what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to devote my life to proclaiming the gospel somehow. I'm going to figure out a way to do it and just do it. Uh, I, I, no, I, it was never my intention to save anybody because I couldn't save anybody, but I could tell them how they could be saved, okay? We do that as human beings, as a church, we put money into missions and so on and so forth. We're proclaiming. We can help them maintain their salvation, but only Jesus can actually save a person's soul. In Colossians, Paul explains the three steps that Jesus goes through to actually do this. The first step, of course, is redemption. So he says in verse 13 and 14, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, Jesus actually pays the moral debt that we owe God on account of our sins and he pays this debt with his death on the cross. Every time I lie, I owe God a moral debt. Every time I have an impure thought, I owe God a moral debt. I steal from my friend next door, even if I go back and apologize and give back the money and I'm square with my friend next door, I have still a debt owed to God because I've broken his commandment. You see what I'm saying? I keep racking up moral indebtedness to God and I don't have anything, I don't have the currency with which to pay that debt because that debt can only be paid for with a perfect life. And so what does Jesus, the Son of God do? He comes in the form of a man, lives a perfect life and offers that perfect life in death on the cross in order to pay the moral debt that all of us owe to God the Father. He offers the only thing that God will accept as payment for our sinful lives, and that is a perfectly lived life. You know, it's amazing to me how many people are always still working on their salvation. They've been Christians 20 years, but in their mind, they're still working on their salvation. And I tell them, stop doing that. It's a waste of spiritual energy. You can't save yourself. You can't save yourself. Jesus is the only one. Once you accept his sacrifice by repentance and baptism, that's the way that you accept you know, his sacrifice on your behalf, that's it. There's nothing else that you can do to make that better. Preachers repeat themselves often and I try to avoid that, but one thing I don't mind repeating is, you're never any more saved than on the day you were baptized. 
You don't get more saved after that. You, you become more righteous, more mature, more sanctified, but you don't get more saved than on the day you come out of that water. I'll tell you something else. You're not saved until you go into that water either, but that's a sermon for another time. The second step that Jesus takes is forgiveness. Now that our debt for sin is fully paid for, God can offer us forgiveness. And then the third step is sanctification. Here in verse 20 to 22, he talks about that. Remember I said you're not saved, any more saved than on the day you're baptized? Yeah, you're, you're saved, your sins are forgiven. But there's a, there's a period of time between the time you come out of the water and the time you die physically. During that time, what happens? Well, you go through a process of sanctification, meaning you're growing spiritually, you're maturing, you're growing in the knowledge of God and your ability to serve Him, your strength and ability to overcome sin on a daily basis. That's called sanctification. People confuse sanctification and salvation. You already got salvation. You're working on sanctification as a way of saying to God, I believe and I still believe. 50 years after my baptism, I'm doing good things. Why? Because God, I still believe that on the day I was baptized, I was saved. And the gratitude from that continues 50 years forward. That's why you do what you do. That's why we mustn't do certain things that are unpleasing to God. And so sanctification is that process where Christ, through his word and the Holy Spirit, matures and prepares the Christian for eternal life in heaven with God. Through Jesus, we become holy, blameless, acceptable. Although the divine quality of Jesus' nature and his intimate relationship with God, as well as the primary position he holds in creation, surely establishes Christ as the only candidate to be the head of the church. I mean, think about that. Anybody else qualify? Who else are you going to put there? It is Jesus' ability to save souls that makes him the only person who can have this position for practical reasons as well. After all, it is this ability to save souls that created the church in the first place. I mean, how, you know, did you read Marty's article this morning? I thought that was a terrific article. You know, please do that, I encourage you to do that. And I'll second it and amen it and add the idea. Someone says, you know, there are hypocrites in the church. There are troublemakers in the church. I go, yes, so? You, you, take, you take 400 people who are sinners and then are saved, what do you got? Well, you've got 400 saved sinners. Uh, and what happens when you put 400 saved sinners in the same room? Yeah, trouble. That's what you get. You get trouble, why? Because they're weak, they're sinful, they're jealous, they're angry, they're human. They're working out their salvation. They're growing up in Christ. They bump into each other. They say things they shouldn't say. You know, stuff happens. You know, without Jesus, this thing called the church would not and could not exist. Why? Because these 400 sinners who have been saved can always go back to Jesus and say, you know, Lord, I, I went too far. I broke my promise not to say what I thought I was going to say and I went and said it anyways. Dear Lord above, I, I've, I've, sinned against my, I've sinned against my brother. I've spoken against my sister, I've whatever. That's why it survives. Because we have a Lord that we can go to with our sins and say to him, please, it's a new day, give me another chance. Let me, let me grow out of this, help me. Help your church, help us. That's why no other prophet or guru or religious leader claims to do all of this. You know, Muslims, they, they, don't, they don't pray to Muhammad to forgive their sins. Jesus is the only one that offers, that, offers that. 
And so the Colossians, you know, they needed to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ and why he was their Lord and the head of the church. Their faith, their hope of salvation, their freedom rested upon the quality of their leader. And so Paul describes a Lord who was supremely qualified to receive their faith and their allegiance and ultimately deliver on his promise of salvation. Let's face it. If, if the one who was uniquely loved by God, divine by nature, first in all things, all powerful, completely devoted to saving them, if this person could not lead them, could not save them, could not be trusted by them, then who in the world could? If Jesus is not the head of this congregation, anybody else can take his place. This is why he encourages them, Paul encourages them, not to be fooled or made prisoner by any person's religious ideas or philosophy that did not have the words of Christ and the spirit of Christ or the leadership of Christ to support them. Very important before you move forward too quickly to do or say or change anything. Make sure that what is moving you what is driving you are the words of Christ and not just your own ideas. Paul says in Colossians 2 verse eight, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form and in him you have been made complete and he is the head over all rule and uh, authority. So we also need to be reminded of how wonderful and able and qualified our Lord is even to this day as the head of the church. After all, we call ourselves the church of Christ for that very reason. We are the church that belongs to Jesus. As we strive to remain faithful, and fruitful and united in one body and spirit. Remember why you are doing these things. You want to honor and glorify our head, our leader, our Lord. Anytime you're not sure about your actions, anytime you're not sure about your motivation, anytime you're not sure about the way that you're doing what you want to do and the, you know, the whole business, ask yourself, how is this serving the Lord? How is this serving the head? Never mind how this is serving me or my agenda. How is this serving the Lord? How is this serving my brethren? How is this serving the lost? Those are the questions that help define the answers that we look for in our everyday life as, as uh, uh, church uh, members. Our allegiance is not to some tradition or historical movement or issue or doctrinal position. Our allegiance is to Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ alone. Our faith is in the head, not the body. Our hope is in the strength of the head, not the size of the body. Our glory is not how great a church we are, but how glorious the head of our church is now and will be forever. Yes, we have a ministry system and we have leaders and, and we have a budget and we have a building and we have all these things uh, necessary and important to do the work of the Lord here on earth. However, let's never forget that all of these people and things come from the head and they are in service and for the honoring of the head of our church who is Jesus Christ. Let's also never forget that every lesson, every exhortation, every admonishment or rebuke that comes from this pulpit concerning the church, whether uh, it be to more faithfulness in attendance or more generous giving or greater service in ministry or deeper love among the brethren and less gossip and infighting, all of these things are said so that in the end we will be more faithful to Christ that we will offer greater service to Christ, that we will love each other with the love of Christ so that the head is in all and through all and over all to God's glory forever and ever, amen. amen. Finally, brothers and sisters, as I close out this lesson on the church and the head of the church, 
let us always remember who we are to preach. When I was doing mission work at the beginning of my ministry, I learned rather quickly that lost souls are not interested in the preaching of the church. I used to start that way. Let me tell you about the church. You know, we're the church, you know, we're different than other churches and blah, 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 blah. But I, I learned very quickly that lost souls, that little gal there who's 23 years old already has two little babies by two different guys and she's still not married and, and working uh, you know, at uh, some service job you know, to support uh, herself and you know, she has no help and she stumbles into church. She's, a, she's not interested if we're the right church and the true church, that, that, that doesn't interest her. Those people are not interested in that. They're hungry for the preaching of Christ. They're hungry to know that God loves me. Even though the mess that I may be in, God still loves me and cares about me. And I can actually see his love and care for me through these strangers that are reaching out to me and taking care of me. Sure, I'm going to have to learn about all these other things, of course, but at the beginning, I'm drowning. I'm drowning. I don't need to hear a lecture. I need to get a safety thing, you know. I need somebody to pull me out. Don't get me wrong, the church is important and necessary because it proclaims Christ, it serves Christ, it's his body. But the church grows and rejoices when people come to know and love and obey the head of the church, who is Jesus. So let's follow Paul's instructions to the Colossians church of long ago. Let us focus our faith and our hope and our love on the head of the church, Jesus Christ and know for certain that he is truly qualified to lead us and to provide all that we need and to transform us into heavenly beings because that's what we're being transformed into, heavenly being. So this morning, ask yourself this set of questions. Is Jesus Christ, is he my head? Is he my leader? Is he my Lord? If not, you can give yourself to him in repentance and baptism and he will add you to his glorious body of which he is the head. Whatever your need this morning, either to become part of his body or maybe to become a better part of his body through prayer and repentance, whatever your need is, we encourage you to come forward now and express it as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.